So our final speaker before we move into discussion mode is Tyrone Hayes. Um, so take it away, Tyrone. Uh, thank you. I want to start by thanking the organizers for having me out, uh, allowing me to participate and share with you. Uh, I also, before I start, I want to acknowledge my funding sources. I also want to disclose that I have been previously funded by the chemical industry, including the manufacturer of the major chemical that I study. And I also want to acknowledge and thank my laboratory and my students, and also my family, and uh, acknowledge my grandmother for her love and support. Um, I got involved in studying chemicals, so-called uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals, when I was asked by the chemical industry to study their chemical atrazine. Atrazine is an herbicide that's mostly used on corn. It's been used since 1958. Uh, we use 80 million pounds annually in the United States. Until fairly recently, it was the number one selling pesticide in the world. It's used in more than 80 countries, and it's now outlawed in all of Europe, which is significant here because the company that manufactures the chemical is actually based in Europe. I was asked to study the effects of atrazine on amphibians. I'm an amphibian endocrinologist. I study amphibian hormones. And when analyzing the impact of atrazine, the effects of atrazine on development in the African clawed frog, we made several discoveries that raised concern. Uh, among those, we found that atrazine inhibited the growth of the voice box or the larynx in frogs. And in addition, we found out because the voice box or the larynx is androgen dependent, we found out that atrazine had an impact on the gonads, the source of androgens or testosterone. Uh, we identified uh, that atrazine caused hermaphroditic <coughs> development. Some animals develop multiple testes and ovaries, which is not normal in amphibians. And, and by that, only, I only mean that there are fish that are naturally hermaphroditic. There are no amphibians that are naturally hermaphroditic. We hypothesized that atrazine had this effect because it induced an enzyme, the machinery, if you will, aromatase, that converts testosterone into estrogen, the so-called female hormone. And as a result, males are demasculinized and females are, uh, and, and subsequently feminized because they're producing the, the female hormone. We showed, in fact, that atrazine caused a decline in testosterone, even in adult males. Um, and then we also later showed that some males that are exposed to atrazine actually completely turn into and are converted into females. So this is a male copulating, mating with another male that, that actually produces eggs. Uh, we also showed that the males that were exposed have uh, reduced reproductive success. They don't show male typical mating behavior. Um, and that's a result of the declining testosterone when they're exposed to atrazine. So on average, control males or unexposed males have higher androgens or testosterone than, uh, than atrazine exposed males. And as a result, those males are unappealing or either not able to compete for, for females during reproductive trials. Even if those males compete, uh, we found that they have a much lower fertility when they're exposed to atrazine. So for example, typical males can fertilize about 85% of the female's eggs compared to atrazine treated males which fertilize only about 15%. The low fertility is a result of both an absence of male mating behavior, but also because the testes are affected. So if you look at atrazine-treated uh, testes from atrazine-treated males, what you find is that they're lacking in sperm. So these are testicular tubules that are filled with sperm, whereas in these males, they are lacking sperm and actually only have cellular debris in their testicular tubules. Um, and again, we found that many of those males actually completely turn into females and, of course, completely lack sperm in their testes. We went on from that to look at uh, whether or not this effect occurred in other species, and we showed that, in fact, if you look at North American frogs, so here's an example of a North American frog exposed to atrazine. These are testes, and these are actually eggs, yolked eggs, that are bursting through the, sur through the surface of, of this male's testes. Uh, we then went on from that, from these laboratory studies, to examine whether or not effects occur in the wild. And here's where we now start to address the more global issues. Um, for example, atrazine is applied at levels that result in 2.9 to 29 million parts per billion contamination in the environment. And again, this is the most commonly used pesticide in the world. 
formerly the, uh, uh, the second most commonly used pesticide in the world, formerly the most. And these levels are two, 29 to 290 million times higher than the levels that we know to be biologically effective. In the United States, agricultural runoff, atrazine levels are found in this range, minimum and maximum. Here are levels that are found in temporary pools, permanent water, and precipitation. And here are the levels that we know to be biologically active in amphibians and fish. So in other words, all types of aquatic environments or habitats are at risk, um, including rainwater. So a half million pounds of atrazine actually come down into rainwater every year, and the atrazine can travel over a thousand kilometers in the clouds and in rainwater, which is in fact why the European Union banned it, because it was banned in France, yet atrazine levels, atrazine continued to show up as a result of application in Germany. Uh, here are the levels of atrazine that are allowed in drinking water in the United States by the Environmental Protection Agency, levels that are 30 times higher than we know to be biologically active. Um, in the field, we actually analyzed animals, and I'm showing you now a cross-section of testis from, uh, under the microscope. And we found that frogs that are exposed to atrazine in the field develop these testicular oocytes, or eggs in their testis, which render them um, essentially non-reproductive. If you look across the United States, the red area shows where most of the atrazine is used. We published another study showing that you find these types of abnormalities in the field, so it's not just a laboratory artifact. And in fact, we found that everywhere you find these sexual abnormalities, you also find atrazine contamination. So there was a very strong correlation. The next question we wanted to ask is, if you look across the United States, much of the landscape in the Midwest looks like this. So this is a photograph from Nebraska. And the problem is, is that there's not just atrazine in that particular landscape. Just on this one field, for example, there are all these herbicides, these fungicides, and these insecticides. So animals, wildlife, are exposed to not just atrazine, but to a collection or a combination of chemicals. And each field, in fact, may be applying different combinations of pesticides. So this is just from one particular field. Uh, we studied how those chemicals interact. So even though you may get effects of individual chemicals like atrazine, we found that when you combine the chemicals, you get much more drastic developmental effects. So for example, the stress hormones are known to cause things like immunosuppression and decreased growth and retarded development. And we found that pesticides tend to increase these stress hormones, which then induce these adverse effects. And the more pesticides you're exposed to, the more individual chemicals, the greater your stress response and the more adverse effects you see. To give you an example of the impact that that kind of combination can have, uh, this is the Salinas River in California, where 85% of the country's lettuce comes from. The Salinas River flows south to north, and as you go north, there are actually more, there's more contamination because more of the farms are north along the river than in the south. So we did a study where we compared upstream of agriculture for Santa Margarita compared to downstream, where there's no pesticides, but lots of environmental stress because the water's being drained off for agricultural purposes. So for example here, there's about 3,000 tadpoles in an inch of water that's at about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And further downstream, the environmental stresses are reduced, but 100% of that water is agricultural runoff. When you look at this on Google Earth, it shows you areas that are quite nice to be a frog, no contamination and no environmental stress. Further down, there's environmental stress, but no pesticide or chemical contamination. And even further down, the environmental stress is removed because the water's there, but the water's all contaminated. Um, as they say, a picture's worth a thousand words. Here's the impact that you see. So for example, this tadpole and this tadpole are collected on the same day. They're the same developmental stage, the, the same age, collected on the same river, just two hours apart. The only difference is this tadpole lives downstream of water that runs off of our food, pesticide contaminated and fertilizer contaminated water. We've shown that although I would never claim that uh, environmental pollutants such as atrazine and these other pesticides are the cause of amphibian decline, 70% of all amphibians are in decline, but there, there's integral and important interactions between environmental pollutants and these other causes of amphibian decline. So for example, the major cause of amphibian decline is 
arguably habitat loss. But if you reduce the water and the only water that's available for amphibians to breed in is water that's contaminated with environmental pollutants, that's fostering pathogens and uh, invasive species and climate change, the, the role of pesticides is pretty critical, um, especially as it interacts with these other factors that contribute. So I use this slide to demonstrate that environmental health and public health are one and the same. This is a slide from Lake Nabugabo in Uganda where the runoff from this crop serves as the same, uh, the source of drinking and bathing and cooking water for the village nearby. And you know, I always point out, here's my village in Oakland. Um, I don't have to take a container to get the water, but that water is coming from an open source that, as I've already demonstrated or suggested, is contaminated with many of the same chemicals that we know to be associated with adverse health outcomes. So in much the same way that Rachel Carson in Silent Spring taught that the death of birds due to pesticides was a warning for us, in much the same way I believe that our pending silent night and the decline of amphibians is a warning. So in addition to amphibians and the impacts of atrazine, other workers have shown that at atrazine causes similar effects across vertebrate classes. So for example, I published a paper with 22 authors from 12 different countries who had independently studied atrazine. And we showed that uh, not only do you see atrazine causing the decline of sperm in amphibian testis, but similar effects have been shown in fish by research in Belgium and reptiles by research in Argentina and rats by researchers in both Europe and in Africa. And also in birds, you see the same effect of where atrazine exposure causes the loss of sperm in the testis. In humans, it's been shown that atrazine is associated with low fertility, so men in Columbia, Missouri, who have significant atrazine levels in their urine have low fertility and low sperm count. If you examine studies in California, atrazine levels in fuel workers are shown here, and atrazine levels in men who apply atrazine are shown here, illustrating that men who apply atrazine can have levels that are 24,000 times what we know to be biologically active in their urine. Uh, most of these workers in California, of course, are Latino, up to 90%. And this raises concern because, of course, California, uh, which is arguably the fifth largest economy in the world, has an economy that's based on agriculture. Half of the U.S.'s food actually comes from California, and 90% of the workers are Hispanic. If you look at the top 10 counties for agriculture in California, so the 10 counties that make us the fifth largest economy in the world, and then we compare that to the 30 poorest towns in California, we see an eerie correlation. So in other words, the people, this is an issue of environmental justice, the people who make us the fifth largest economy in the world are also the targets of chemicals that we know to be associated with adverse health outcomes. As I told you, atrazine induces aromatase, which leads to overproduction of estrogen, which causes egg production in frogs, but it's also associated with two of the most important cancers in humans, both breast cancer and prostate cancer. In their own factory in San Gabriel, Louisiana, a community that's 80% African American, they've shown that there's an 8.4 fold increase in prostate cancer in their workers who work bagging atrazine. There are studies showing very strong correlation between atrazine contamination and breast cancer in women. This is a study from Kentucky. Um, and that's just a correlation, but if you look at rats, again, there's a decline in testosterone and an increase in estrogen with atrazine exposure. And that estrogen is associated with an increase in the incidence of mammary cancer induced in rats that are exposed to atrazine in their drinking water. So it's just a correlation in humans, but one that we can match with controlled experimental data. These, of course, aren't my data. What's more is that human cells, if you expose human cells to atrazine, atrazine induces aromatase and estrogen production, just like we've seen in fish and reptiles and birds and in rodents. And this raises concern because aromatase expression and estrogen production are, of course, very important in the growth and spread of breast cancer. In fact, one of the things that I find most disturbing is the number one treatment for breast cancer right now is a chemical called letrozole that reduces aromatase and estrogen. And at the same time, we are number one contaminant drinking water is a chemical that does exactly the opposite, that turns on aromatase, increases estrogen, and we know is associated with the induction of breast cancer and controlled laboratory studies and correlated with breast cancer in women who are exposed 
Most disturbing, up until 2000, the same company made both chemicals. So Novartis in 2000 made both the atrazine and the letrozole. Um, yeah, they didn't like it when I first pointed that out. <laughs> um, along the environmental justice issue, what I'm showing you now in red, or what's shown here, the top 13 cancers that you're likely to get in the United States. And in red now are 11 of the 13 that you're more likely to get if you're African American, if you're black. And similar data available for Hispanics. What I'm showing you now are the mortality rates relative to white or Caucasian Americans. If you're black, you're more likely to die from 13 out of 13 cancers. We now know that less than 10% of cancer is due to genetics. And my question is, how much of cancer is actually due to environmental exposure? Are you more likely to get breast cancer if your mother or your sister or your aunt had it because of genetics, or more likely because your mother, your sister, or your aunt have all been exposed to the same crap that you're exposed to? As a minority, you're more likely to live in and more likely to work in areas where you're exposed to chemicals, um, and I believe that's a, an important consideration. So essentially, my studies in this aquatic organism, I think, have taught me a lot about this aquatic organism, literally. The same hormones that are important in human fetal development are important in amphibians. And we now know that we, as Americans, are exposed to over 300 synthetic chemicals. It is associated with prostate and mammary cancer in rats. It's associated with immune failure in rats, which we've also shown in frogs. It causes neural damage when rats are exposed in utero. And perhaps the most moving, for me, of the studies in rats are ones that were actually done by the Environmental Protection Agency. Atrazine causes abortion, and this is peer-reviewed and published, in rats that are exposed during pregnancy. Of those rats that don't abort, atrazine causes prostate disease. So the male pups are born with the prostate of an old man. Of those rats that don't abort, atrazine uh, causes impaired mammary or breast development in the female uh, uh, offspring. And as a result, when those offspring grow up, their offspring have retarded growth and development because of the inability to produce milk properly. In other words, this rat, oops, this rat never saw atrazine. This rat was ex affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. So essentially, our grandchildren could be, will likely be impacted by chemicals that we're using today without proper assessment and regulation. The reality is a colleague of mine has shown that if you get pregnant during peak atrazine contamination, you're more likely to have birth defects, and I don't have time to show you all of those, but among those birth defects are genital malformations in males that are exposed to atrazine, sons that are exposed to atrazine in utero. And again, I won't read this, the picture's worth a thousand words. If you're exposed to atrazine during pregnancy, you're more likely to have a son the type of spadius, when the urethra doesn't end all the way through the penis, you're more likely to have a son with cryptorchidism, where the testicles don't descend into the scrotum. You're more likely to have a son with micropenis, where the penis doesn't grow. And what interested me here is that this is just a correlation, but we know that male genital development is dependent on androgens, and that these malformations are also inducible by estrogen. And we know that atrazine decreases androgens and increases estrogens. So we have a very important uh, finding with a mechanism to back it up. I want to conclude with, uh, I was originally told that I got involved in atrazine, don't be an advocate, let the science speak for itself. But a couple things have moved me other than just my realization of the problems that we're dealing with. Uh, one is the manufacturer states on their website that they assume no obligation to uplift forward-looking statements to reflect actual results. Um, somebody has to take responsibility for that. Mm. The other one is the EPA said about my science action in 2006 that the ultimate decision is much bigger than science that weighs in public opinion. And somebody's already mentioned here today the ivory tower and I you know, had this interesting interaction where my mom asked me how important were my PNAS in nature papers. She said, I went to Barnes and Noble, they never heard of those <laughs> magazines. Um, and it makes me realize that of course we have to be an advocate if the EPA is counting on my mom to have an opinion. We have to make sure that my mom has that information. So now I follow a different philosophy. Uh, those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. And if you're wondering, this guy said that. Yeah, thank you.